Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Marco San Michele, the director of the Italian Museum of Design from the Triennale. I'm glad to welcome you uh, to this one of the super talks uh, curated by Stefano Boeri. Uh, and uh, here I have to thank Mrs. Maria Cristina Didero, whom I uh, salute and thank for having invited me to talk about one of the most important protagonists of international design. This conversation is going to be in Italian and due to our friends following us uh, on social media platforms, uh, we have to uh, indeed uh, sit with our, our shoulders uh, to this part of the audience. And uh, we will not turn around uh, because uh, we have to be uh, taken from by the cameras. Okay, introducing Michele De Lucchi is far from being easy, especially because he was a leading figure of one of the most important events in the recent history of design and international architecture. And today with his uh, studio is the ambassador of a way of interpreting the culture of project and design, which is extremely revolutionary. Because he has the strong will of revising, rewriting some of the paradigms of uh, living together and uh, uh, living in a home, building up a community and creating architecture. I'm talking about building a community because uh, usually, you know, people uh, talk about uh, alchemy and Memphis in the career of uh, architect De Lucchi, but of course uh, the uh, story of Olivetti and therefore being part of this large company uh, whereby communities were being built must have fought his own uh, personality because uh, he went through that time not only uh, sharing space and death uh, with great heroes in our country, such as Ettore Sotsas, but also because after that experience, his very name was connected to cultural ventures, spaces that are part of our own daily life, banks, uh, uh, post offices, museums, because sometimes when you talk about architecture and design, it seems that everything is very far away into an empirical world. Uh, and indeed, architecture is one of the arts uh, that has uh, most impacted our life day in, day out. Um, he was invited uh, to be a mem board member of uh, great museums. He's a colleague from the Triennale because he's part of the uh, scientific committee of the Triennale and uh, attended uh, the Venice Biennale. He was director of Thomas, he's active in a number of countries, but he's especially an Italian citizen whom I believe uh, is a flagship of the uh, historical skills in our country. And through history, we kind of uh, uh, jump on the springboard to get into the future. Welcome, Architect De Lucchi. We can start with a presentation because talking about all uh, projects by Michele De Lucchi would be very difficult in just 40 minutes, uh, but we want to listen to his words more than anything else. And I will do it together with you. There is a chapter in this uh, extremely compelling book, uh, which is called Stations, Architectures for the Planet Earth, uh, that De Lucchi published for Silvana Editoriale, signed not only by architect De Lucchi, but this uh, um, acronym, A. M.D.L. Circle, who are the extinct poets of this uh, A.M.D.L. Circle. Well, you know me very well, and therefore you know uh, that uh, I am only apparently very calm and relaxed but in actuality, I am absolutely restless and uh, I cannot keep myself from doing, from thinking, from finding ideas and solutions. And I must first and foremost uh, feed this impatience, so otherwise uh, I get 
anxious. Those of you who are impatient know how tough it is uh, when you have to go through that. So some time ago, I was being impatient because I thought that nothing was being done in spite of all these big changes and transformations, etc. You know, uh, in spite of the fact that technology and scientific discoveries uh, uh, of our contemporary time, I thought, were just uh, changing too little. So I started to gather a few friends. My collaborators, first of all, uh, colleagues, uh, but also psychiatrists, uh, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts uh, anthropologists, uh, scientific experts in neurology, and uh, many others indeed. And at a time when I had to uh, appoint this bunch of people who were by far not homogeneous, they didn't belong to the same discipline or anything else, I have found a name which uh, sounded good. And so I created this circle. It's nothing really, it's not an entity uh, labeled in any possible way. In actuality, it's just a bunch of people. Together with uh, them, we're just trying to face with a little impatience, this very moment we all have to be faced with. And we would like to find good, positive solutions uh, and we want to jump into the future uh, with uh, sometimes because what we leave to the young generation must be better than what we got when we were young ourselves. And with this, with this circle, we uh, um, created the stations, the stations of the planet Earth. We thought and we said to ourselves, if we want to do uh, something good, first of all, we have to work on the will of getting something new. If we really want to do something new, we have to give idea, we have to prove that there is a reason in order to work out new things. And so we decided to design a few projects, uh, which you are seeing. Uh, here. I'm not talking about them all one by one because it takes much time and too long and I'm sure that uh, you would crop up with ideas and we would start talking about it and I would love it but we cannot do it today. So these stations are just and simply a way of thinking about architecture not from the uh, architect standpoint, but um, from the point of view of contemporary people who are not just happy to be architects and that's that. And so with our friends, anthropologists, scientists, psychoanalysts in particular, because here in Milan, there is a very strong group of psychoanalysts, both uh, therapists and um, psychoanalysts who deal with issues connected with organization and sociologists as well. And with all of them, I gathered all the ideas that sounded more practical and more transferable into a visualized architectural project, which you could show. And this uh, somewhat calmed down my anxiety and impatience because today you can actually see things with a great deal of precision and realism and uh, I usually make the most of this. Well, I really would like to know more, if you like, um, about this issue uh, of being helped by psychoanalysis, this um, uh, strong crave of um, getting deep down into the mystery of the ego. And uh, I'd like to um, remind you all of uh, engineer Ernesto Gismondi, who is no longer with us, that in the 90s uh, revolutionized uh, the world of light uh, with a project called Human Lights. And he invited psychoanalysts, psychologists, uh, scientists uh, to contribute to design stages which uh, once upon a time were only managed by architects and engineers. Yes, I was part of that group as well. It was wonderful. It was very compelling indeed. And, um, you know, it wasn't just simply a stone in, thrown into the water. There's something that over time created a number of uh, beliefs, so to say. After all, if you really think about it, it's 
crystal clear that our living environment is actually playing a role on our personality, on our persona, on our way of thinking. Easy to think that if you're being born in the Bronx or uh, on the 75th street, um, there is a different relationship with the rest of the world. And uh, the way you perceive things to the way you see society, you think about a uh, city, the future, relationships, etc. changes. For sure, space is no longer being thought as a place of separation, but you have to think about space as a place that uh, engages you, uh, where people and interests uh, walk together, personas are together, and recipes uh, function together. Um, and I have written in the book um, that I like very much thinking that architects should begin designing uh, and developing their projects, no longer thinking about the walls that are dividing, as I was taught, and as it was taught to many, walls uh, separate uh, a property, uh, the bathroom from the bedroom, the kitchen from the uh, living room, etc. Uh, a wall divides, you know, and uh, okay, let's build up a wall because we want to get divided. Uh, uh, and I'm referring to the Chinese wall uh, that was being done uh, years and years ago. Walls unite, do not divide. Walls do unite. If we were to have a new generation of architects uh, believing that the walls are uh, a connecting uh, instrument uh, well, we would jump uh, into a new mindset, which is a contemporary mindset, our contemporary mindset, which we would like um, to be a widespread mentality and uh, mindset, not just ours. And we would jump into this world with a far greater authority, because the role of an architect, indeed, is not just designing or drafting a project of a house, or giving a shape to things, or choosing materials and colors. But the role of the architect is designing behaviors, uh, understanding how these walls, these doors, these compositions, these colors play a role into other people's lives and therefore become essential factors for the growth of each single one of us. Now, psychoanalysts, no matter what their background is, also the psychoanalysts of psychoanalysts, whom I liked very much and I run into, I didn't even know that there were psychoanalysts uh, uh, helping other psychoanalysts to go through their profession well. Well, these people helped me a lot to understand this. And there is a conversation in the book with, with a psychoanalyst, a woman who deals with the problem um, of kids. And her name is Donatella Capioli. Um, and she tries to understand how kids absorb and make them become theirs, all the environments that they went through when they were babies, etc., and help them little by little to build up their own identity. I also feel very much about the importance of the issue of psychoanalysis in infancy because of a very personal factor. And this is the reason why I wear a big and this is a thing, an anecdote that I often talk about because it has to do with my life as a kid and my life as a, a twin kid who, who's identical. Uh, I don't know whether I am myself or I am him because well, they probably we got probably switched when we were babies. We were so e so. Uh, equal, so the same, and we used to behave exactly in the same way, that as soon as I could, uh, as soon as I had a few hair uh, on, on my face, um, you know, I wanted to uh, grow a beard, and of course he didn't, he used to shave himself. So we tried to get uh, different, and we tried to do it in any possible way. 
the beard was my first project and I used to say that because uh, designing means uh, building a difference, building an identity, uh, facing and addressing the issue of uh, how to entertain a relationship with others and uh, uh, there's nothing more concise and true than just uh, designing oneself the way you look upon yourself, etc. Sorry, uh, what comes to my mind is that a couple of days ago, I met into, I met, I met and I ran into of one of my uh, psychoanalyst friends and told me an incredible thing, an amazing thing, and I never thought about it. And he said that there is a great difference in a way uh, that uh, Western people have to meet compared to East people from the East, because we people from the West, when we look to each other, we concentrate our attention to the eyes and then to the mouth. Uh, people from the East concentrate their attention on the nose. And this is a scientifically proven fact. It's not just a joke, uh, but it's scientifically proven. And this comes from a number of assumptions that people make um, uh, as human beings connected to our cultural backgrounds. And, uh, uh, you know, when you look at, say, face, uh, what strikes you is certain details rather than others. I don't know how uh, they manage now with a mask because the nose gets uh, hidden, uh, um, but in one way or another, they will make it. Uh, and that's very curious, and I shall definitely pay attention to this. While we're uh, speaking, uh, there are a number of slides that are extremely visionary. We talked about the mystery of the ego, uh, the power of the background and the context, but the visual power of all these pictures uh, is part of uh, your maturity and a path uh, that uh, you tra traded and uh, the way you got to the present day. Can you expand on this because there are many designers and architects? Uh, well, the uh, project stations, first of all, I have to say, the um, here we have no science fiction. Earth stations does not mean going back uh, onto the uh, planet Earth after having visited Mars, uh, Jupiter, and the Moon. These are not interplanetary stations. These are stations on the planet Earth to live on the Earth, and these are stations because, and exactly because, these are places you have to go when you pick up a destination. And the final destination, we all know what it is, is to be here, to be able to be here. And this is the reason why I called them stations, to provide them, to give them a kind of a physiognomy, a shape, what that we expect architecture to talk through. And actually, if you pay attention, these are all buildings and they are actually being grouped in four different clusters. Well, today I've, I've grouped them in four different clusters and these buildings if you have noticed, they don't have any facade, they don't have any back, they don't have any right hand side or left hand side, as a Renaissance buildings, for instance, would feature, or even buildings from our more East recent history, you know. Well, actually, these buildings, they have their own identity, irrespective from the side you're looking at them. And they are meeting points, they are places where people meet. And uh, what is important for me is, is the reason people decide to group together. People who are somehow associated to one another through beliefs and through way of being. And, and I have identified four different reasons. The first one, The first one lies in the need that all of us have to grow, to grow the willingness, the imagination, the need again to be creative and to cope, to face with any critical time through creativity. We cannot cope with any critical time by giving up to it in the first place. And, and this is not so obvious, and this is not 
so much taken for granted because whenever we come across a problem, not necessarily we're coping with it and actually we try to kind of run away from it, especially if we do expect troubles to come out of that. And in order for me to do so, and, and actually, this is something that I find out in my everyday profession, that actually the more functionalities you're able to put together in the same project, the more opportunities you find out to be creative and even, even encountering the unexpected, you know? And, you know, the unexpected, so what you do not expect, let's say, typically, well, actually, they might shake you up, you know? It may provide you with some extra energy and it provides you with that great energy you need so that you can make you can make it on your own. You can find solution on your own. And if you take a museum nowadays, where no, you're just no longer becoming gardens of uh, sculptures or paintings uh, and you put them on pedestal, this is just no longer the place. You go to museums to have conversations, you have workshops, there are conference halls, there are restaurants, there are food corners, there are libraries. And, and actually, a museum is an increasingly like, uh, lovely, uh, lovely meeting place. And actually, this allows people to be more vital and, uh, you know, to share their energy. Offices, if you take offices, well, they're no longer a desk next to each other with some beautiful computers in a tight position. But actually offices and people who are now designing offices, also office designers, actually are struggling trying to make it nice for people to come to work. As millennials, they're not so much willing to, you know, to shut themselves in the dusty areas where you would spend eight hours of your day in a very polite position with your suit and tie and being there on a nine to six. Uh, well, they want to go to the office as long as they have something back. They want to spend their precious time there and uh, exploiting potentials. This is why office designers, they have to commit themselves to allow people to have a great quality time as they're spending time there. So, so a very first cluster of earth stations go around this number of topics I've mentioned. The second one has to do with the climate. Well, as you all know, we are now going through a climate change issue. We do have desert land, we do have a rainy, uh, rainy areas, uh, we do have a, 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 a increasingly modified an environment. And actually the most, let's say what comes out of that is, let's say that I, I would love to assimilate a, a climate to a kind of craftsmanship because climate means that architecture will have to rework the buildings accordingly. So if you take tropical, you will come across vegetation, plants derived, materials, bamboo, and so on. So what I have done, I have identified the five key, uh, let's say the five key climate, and I've imagined uh, to come up with uh, buildings, cathedrals, you name it, uh, uh, considering what is the craftsmanship around each and every climate type. And, uh, and I, I'd love to emphasize this idea of a hands-on and craftsmanship, because actually, if you think about having hands-on, it means that you're cultivating the soil, you're seeding your plants, you're, you're preparing your food as well. And this is still a hands-on project, right? And actually, when it comes to authenticity in food, it's not a, a mass food, but it's something that you cook your own, is the homemade. And uh, lots of people actually uh, finding food preparation, uh, their own identity, their own way to express themselves as well. And then there's a third cluster of earth stations, and that is simply associated to education. When I say education, it's not teaching how to read or write, you know, it's not just uh, simply that. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking more about education of, of knowledge and how to make the best of it, how to make the best use of, uh, of knowledge, of your learning. So 
the way we're now interacting with knowledge are, are way different from the ones I, I have experienced as a young man. And uh, we're now being in contact uh, with learnings and knowledge through smartphones, website, uh, computers, and so on. What is still missing though, and, uh, and that is something that I've researched into in some of these pictures you're now seeing, is the connection, nexus among the different generations. Now, I have, uh, there's so much, uh, I realize that there's so much in the world that, you will, that we may learn about if we, let's say, clear out our mind a bit, because we've always believed that things can only be, let's say, pursued in a certain manner, but perhaps we have to be open-minded and welcome new ones. So this is why I love these earth stations, because I see generations, a, a, helping each other. So I do have people helping me out in, um, let's say, how to drive an e-car, an electronic car, or perhaps how to use a computer. Whereas myself, I can learn, I can teach people uh, about what I've learned throughout my life, throughout my career, and uh, allowing people to make the best of my knowledge and what I can get across. Uh, because again, the, the bottom line, the key objective here is, is to is, uh, is to project ourselves to a more appealing future for everybody. And the last one is the, the last cluster, is cluster of communities. Well, you know, as an architect, I'm, I've drawn plenty of buildings and residential buildings and so on. And uh, when I when I design buildings, uh, actually, I'm I'm thinking about condos. You know, those uh, all entangled snakes all being uh, all together, being all intertwined together. And that is what comes to mind uh, when, I, when I think about a condo scenario. Whereas, uh, uh, where, whereas perhaps uh, these condos environment uh, are those where people become uh, kind of aggressive uh, uh, at times. And that is not the best way, you know to express yourself. So I've started to wonder, how can we possibly rethink perhaps a building where people are happy to go and live together? In a, in a condo style, if you will, but in a different building. So let's group together passion, hobbies, dreams of people, and let's come up with houses and buildings where actually people, they share community of interest and they love to be together. For instance, a building, for people who love, uh, who love making music or people who are the fixer, you know, they love to uh, adjust and fix everything that gets broken. Or why, how about a building where people are enjoying partying and having conversation? And so actually I, I have identified five different reasons why people would love to group together and have imagined their own building. But again, to get this message across, well, first, you have to identify what is it that makes you willing to be with, your, with the next person uh, by, who's sitting next to you. Now, I don't know whether I would actually build a building for designers because that would, be, that would be kind of a warehouse, if you will, maybe. And well, I have to say that, you know, as I'm listening to you, I, I am so surprised. Uh, you spoke about uh, how to clear out mind of things that are no longer useful, impatient, uh, kind of a disobedience uh, in uh, rethinking a number of paradigms, which perhaps are kind of outdated, if you will. And still, these places, uh, there's a uh, they, they're still deeply rooted uh, in, in the past because you're still mentioning being together uh, and grouping together. Now, I, now that I think about it, after we've been set apart because of the pandemic, well, that let me hope for, for a bright future again. Well, we're having people here who are grouping together because of the Super Salon occasion. So I'm thinking, uh, my next question perhaps is, uh, 
where is it that we may find some of these ideas already around and even by mentioning some of your already existing architecture works? Because actually, I would, uh, you, you, you spoke about behaviors right at the beginning. So how can we see this more in practical terms? Well, let me say that we do observe some of these already. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, the topics are, are, are always the same, are still the same. And for once, I can tell you that these are no longer topics that are, let's say, trendy or uh, but something that are going to be lasting for longer times, say. So those are trendy topics, if you will. It's something that, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that sometimes they can be trendy and I'm okay, but they are supposed to be lasting for a longer time. So this occasion, the super salone, the fuori salone, all the exhibitions around this main event, well, we love them, we like them, they make us happy. And uh, we do know that we're going to bring something back uh, after we've visited some of these exhibits. But at times, they make us feel embarrassed. And, um, and I think that is, that is, that is a, a true for everybody. And now I'm, I'm telling you why. Because I'm, I'm considering, you know, there's so many things and structures being built, uh, they are no longer being used. And the question I'm often asked is, uh, why are you drawing a new chair? We already have plenty, millions of chairs around. Now, finding an answer to this, uh, I think is everybody's commitment. It should be everybody's commitment. Be because we can't not think of walking into the future by uh, making younger generation giving up something that we have benefited from so greatly in our life, in our career. So we don't want to take anything away from the newer generation. This is not right. This is not fair. So we have to make it possible for them to do exactly the same things we've done. So we have to make that possible as a, we, we need to avoid for instance, uh, uh, we need to avoid waste. We need to, uh, and uh, waste, when I talk through waste, I'm thinking about waste in the broader sense, say from, from food waste uh, and uh, from, from buildings waste and so on. And let me tell you this. Well, first of all, we need to be able to provide the best re representation of a, of a changing world. And that is, bullet point number one. Number two, we are more and more approaching natural materials. Let me tell you that, for instance, wood will never create any waste. There's no pure piece of wood that will contaminate, that will spoil, that will ruin, that will become, that will translate into waste. You know, wood is, is beautiful forever and it will always work good. And uh, wood it means that uh, we can preserve forests and, uh, and also it allows us uh, to be in greater harmony uh, with, the, with, with the environment. The research from Kocha and Mancuso, for instance, are crucial. I'd love to mention these two examples. And these are things that we should learn about more. So intelligence and the neurology from plants uh, are, are, are more and more now being, being researched into and they are more and more shaping the mindset of today. And uh, all of these, uh, all of these uh, uh, occasions, all of these events, such as Salone de Mobile, I wish they could be even more drama-like, you know? I don't know whether you're familiar uh, with screenplay and, and, and this other kind of things, but actually, let me tell you that screenwriters, uh, they can come up with whatever, with whatever, with very little, you know? Having a, perhaps, a pop from the 1500 and a, and you can make and you can make it a baroque part or a, a beautiful piece of art. What I'm saying is that your mind should be taken to a place where it can imagine and be as creative as possible. And again, my neurologist friends, they confirm 
that the perception of the imagination and perception of reality, well, often, uh, often they kind of have a, a blurred, uh, a, a blurred a separation, and they and, and they say, you know, when we are living a dream, uh, we're experiencing a dream, we experience that so intensely that the perceptions that we had as we were dreaming are going to be exactly the same as you as you have a a, a a light dream, basically. What I'm saying is that we should really play with these two uh, dimensions more. So fantasy, association, and reality in our mind, in our perception, uh, they should be valorized as being intertwined, as being uh, one on top of the other, two dimensions that are coexisting together and they shape us together. I, I hope I'm being understood through all of this talking. Well, I believe I believe so, uh, but I actually there's something else that I that I've, I'd love to ask. So I've seen some of these monumental uh, air stations, uh, and uh, as I as I look at them, they remind me of a of a former and past geographies a uh, playing together cultivating the land and uh, they even belong to some uh, spiritual uh, dimension as well although they're very practical so my question is has this been perhaps a uh, your willingness to think about venues about places uh, like the one that we've seen in, in this picture here, this very uh, huge uh, cylindric building uh, that actually reminds me uh, something as a boy as I was traveling uh, through Corinthus uh, and uh, on a canal. But it could, this could be a canyon as well. Well, you began this meeting talking about Ettore Sotsas. If you take a look at Ettore Sotsa's works, and um, you reminded me of it right now, first of all, you will find uh, the uh, objects for uh, rites, the ritual objects, uh, and what he used to uh, call the planet as a festival. You will find something similar to that. Uh, he imagined a kind of a flying saucer uh, on a river whose name I, I, I can't remember, but um, so nilly willy I have absorbed uh, Ettore's uh, mindset. I was copying him. Uh, you, you don't know, but Ettore Sotsas may write uh, with the right uh, and left. He, he was both right and left-handed. He started to draw with the right and then continued with the left. I, and I spent months and months and months trying to do the same. I'm not left-handed at all. And I made terrible effort. And then eventually I quit. I just gave up. But Ettore Sotsas in my life was fundamental and I will never deny it. Uh, thanks to him, I got into Olivetti. I joined Olivetti and uh, the same year, uh, I uh, shared this idea of Memphis uh, and what he thought about provocative and avant-garde design and architecture, um, as he used to call it. Now, this figure of a, a person you make reference to is important. Uh, you make me think right now of how much I owe uh, to a person like Ettore as a reference, not because I used to copy him. Yes, I did copy him for some time, but today I am uh, myself independently from uh, everything. But having a figure of reference is always very useful because you want to get into a mindset about life uh, which has the pace of a ritual of celebration of uh, always finding um, a foundation i enjoyed uh, 
it's a great honor, uh, and, and you're absolutely fantastic in reminding us of uh, how important Italy was, uh, because in spite of your seniority, uh, because people you walk with uh, for some time in life are, are just custodians, uh, whether they're present or absent, uh, whether they're physically there or immaterial, uh, they're always with us. We're about to end this conversation, and I would like to ask you to say goodbye to us with a wish, given that uh, uh, right now people talk a lot about uh, restarting, having a new will, a thousand different things, etc. What do you feel uh, of most urgent. Come on, the future is better than the past. We are going to make it. Uh, all of us, uh, we shall overcome the environmental crisis, the social crisis, the economic crisis. We have to do it. We have to work together and we must do it. And I would like to say goodbye to you, getting back to impatience. A very young Bruno Monari, when arrived in Milano to meet futurists, went uh, to lunch with Prampolini. Prampolini said, you are as impatient, as nervous as we are. And Monari became uh, part of the uh, Milanese futuristic movement. Yes, a pinch more of impatience. Thank you, Michele De Lucchi. Thank you all. Enjoy the super salone. Thank you.